All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. Last week was New Year's Eve. I was down in LA visiting family. It's my grandma's 91st birthday. Always good to see her. So um, we've had the turn of the calendar, which I think is always a fun time um, to preach around because we seem to have this arbitrary idea that when the calendar flips, like a whole bunch of things in our lives can change with resolutions or a new calendar year. Um, But we'll talk about um, God's truth and how that fits into all of this. So I want to start today by reading. This is the main verse we're going to focus on, but it's part, as we'll see, it's part of a section. This is a very well-known verse to a lot of us that I think just as one verse standing alone encourages us and makes us feel really good. But hopefully as we unpack the context of it, we can see that it may not mean what we think it means at face value, but it's actually really good news for our lives. So I'm going to read just this one verse first, and then we'll read the full section in a little bit. But this is Jeremiah 29, 11, and it simply says this. It's one of my favorite verses. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And I think it's a good verse for us to read at the start of the year because a lot of times, like I said, once the calendar flips, we have high hopes for this coming year. All the things that we think were negative in the previous year, we're hoping that they're done with. And just because we're in the the year ends in one different digit, we think things might be different. But this is a great verse for us to think about at the start of the new year. Um, Last week, Daniel shared with us uh, from Isaiah 40 about those who wait upon the Lord will have renewed strength. And I think that's a great way for us to um, kind of get into the new year because certainly we know there are ways that we are looking for renewed strength in our lives. Um, for this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, one time, I can't remember if it was here on a Sunday morning or Friday night during youth group, but I often ask, what is the second most famous Bible verse? Because we know John 3.16 is, you know, the most, fam- most well-known verse. And I'm usually looking for Romans 3.23, but, like, we get all these other answers of what possibly might be, like, the second most famous Bible verse. And last time, it may have been Callie. I think it was Callie who said Jeremiah 29.11. And I was like, ooh, that's a new one. It wasn't you? It was not you. Okay, my memory's failing me. It was someone else. I can't remember if it was Friday or Sunday. But here's the, here's the thing. I know this is a very good Instagram bio kind of verse. What I mean by that is a lot of people, myself included, have a Bible verse, their favorite Bible verse in their Instagram bio. Okay. Now, I could give some commentary about that like for like an entire sermon, but I'm not going to do that today because we want to get into this verse. But a lot of times I can see why this verse might be popular because at least on face value, it encourages, it encourages us with the truth that, wait, God has a plan for my life. God has plans that involve my, my good and good things for my future. And we can read this verse And we can start to think, God is going to give me everything I want in 2024, or fill in the blank, or whenever we think about this verse. And the amazing thing is, the context of this verse is definitely not that. But it's still extremely good news for us to read these these words from this verse and understand what it means. So before we go into the new year, thinking, okay, new year, new me, like all the problems of 2023 aren't here like anymore, and we can read a verse like this and think, oh man, like God's going to give me so many great things in this new year. We should really understand the context of this verse, and I think it's great news for us. So with that, I want to read starting in verse 4. So this very Instagrammable like verse, we can take it and put it in its uh, proper context and see what was going on at the time that Jeremiah was speaking these words to the nation of Israel thousands of years before. So, starting in verse 4, I'm going to read all the way down to verse 14. So if you've got your Bibles, you can go to Jeremiah 29, or it'll be up here on the screen. This is the ESV. Some versions might be slightly different. But this will help inform us of the context of where this positive, encouraging verse comes from. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, 
Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill, you to, I will fill, fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. This is God's word. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are our God, that you have shown us your faithfulness, just as we just sang. And in many ways that I think if we think deeply about, we can see uh, in the wake of the past year ways that you have have blessed us, ways that we um, have cause for uh, just thanksgiving for how faithful you are. And Lord, we also know that in this coming year, we will face challenges. There will be trials, just as there are in any other year of our lives. And so, Lord, would you open our hearts to the truth that comes from your word? Can we learn from what your people have gone through? during trying times in their lives and see how you are a good God who loves us and is with us and always has a plan for us, even when it may not seem that way um, from our own human thinking. So God, for all these reasons, would you open our hearts to your word and what we just read and may these words speak into and encourage our hearts this morning. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Based on this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, and now the surrounding context that we've read, we're going to talk about three things from this passage. We're going to see first that God has a plan, and we see that. It's written very clearly. Now, secondly, we're going to see that God's plan may not always be our plan, and we can gather that from the context that we just ran, uh, read. But pro- finally, we will see how God's plan is for our good. So verse 11 starts off with the, with the words, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Now, we'll get into the context a little bit as we go through our first couple points. Um, but if this is something that we read and we're encouraged by, there must be some level of trust that we have in God, that he has plans, that that actually could be a good thing for our lives. And so in this case, as Jeremiah is writing these words and speaking these words to the people of Israel, who is the audience? I just said it. I worked that backwards from my notes. But God's people, the people of Israel, were here kind of mid-Old Testament. They are hearing these words from Jeremiah the prophet. And we'll see the context and how detailed it gets. But if you were part of the nation of Israel, you would have heard stories of how God had been faithful to his people throughout their generations. Now, this is something that I don't think we, I don't think we can understand in the same way that the people did. There's reason for that. But if you were a part of the nation of Israel, you would remember the story of how God sent a flood and Noah and his family were rescued from an evil generation as the flood came and kind of wiped out that area and Gave, the, gave God's people a chance to start over and be free from the influence of sin that existed in their culture. If you were part of the nation of Israel, you would know how you were born out of the tribe of Abraham and how God was faithful to him, even though his family story was kind of like windy and tumultuous, and yet God was very faithful to him and providing many uh, offspring and many descendants in a big family when it seemed like there was not, no chance of that in his younger years. You would know how your people were set free from Egypt, from slavery, how God parted the Red Seas and walked across on dry land. If you've watched The Prince of Egypt, like we know a little bit about of that. We mainly think of Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston when we think of that from the song that they sang in The Prince of Egypt and the Disney, it's not a Disney movie. Is it a Disney movie? I don't know. It's not a, DreamWorks, that's right. Okay, I should know these things. Um, But 
We have some understanding of this from how we might have read about it in Sunday school or how we might have seen it in a movie or done some research on it. But God's people at this time and throughout the Old Testament lived in a storytelling culture where they would know these stories much better than we do today. And as a result of that, they would see how God had been faithful over and over and over again. They would remember much better than we remember. Like, you know, we have Instagram stories. They had actual, like, stories where they were listening. And as they're listening to the story, they weren't looking down as the story was being told, like, at a screen. But because they didn't have the internet, because they didn't have the forms of technology that we had, the only way to preserve important stories was by word of mouth and hearing it from those older than you in your culture. And they placed such a strong value on passing down their, their people's history. You know, we have a lot of history within our families, within our Asian culture that gets passed down to us. For them, it would be even more so than today because of the lack of technology and just how this was a strength of their culture. If you heard a story, you would remember most of the details because your mind wasn't flooded by all the different algorithms that often flood our minds from whatever like we're looking at or consuming. It was a very different time where people would have much greater remembrance of how God had been faithful to his people in the past. And so if God's people have an understanding of his plan and how he's worked in Israel's past before, If we are God's people today, and how we can start to contextualize this, we have to remember that God has worked in our pasts as well. And that might not be easy for us when our minds are constantly on the future, and what do I need to take care of, what do I need to do today? But at the start of 2024, one of the best things we can do is we can look back at this past year and think about what was even just one way, what was one way that God was faithful to me in this past year? And if we can remember that that's true, then when the trials of this year come, and they certainly will, we can see how God has constantly been faithful to us in our past. God had a plan for 2023, and he certainly has one again for this this year. And so if we can pause and think about what was the most substantial thing that I want to be thankful for from this past year, I think we can look back and see God certainly did have plans for our lives. Maybe at the start of 2023, our plan was not to go on the Mexico trip if you were in youth group or to get baptized or to make some kind of commitment to trying to uh, come to Friday nights or come to Wednesday nights if you're a part of Vertigo and really grow in our spiritual lives. That may not have been on our radar at the start of the year, and yet I think many of us can look back and see ways that that was part of God's plan. And we may not have felt that each and every day with all of the challenges that we face in our lives, but it shows us that God's plan does exist and that it is always working. Now, what happens when it doesn't go the ways that we expect, though? It's easy for us to look back on the high points of this past year and think, God was certainly at work, but it might be more challenging when the the low points of this year inevitably come or when we think about painful things that we've been through in this past year. And so what happens when God's plan isn't what we expect it is? Or a better way of saying it is, what happens when God's plan is not my plan? And that's where we can see the power of the truth of this passage when we understand the context. Because as we've read with the surrounding context to verse 11, Jeremiah is speaking these words to God's people as they have been sent into exile under Babylonian control. And I can tell you, that was probably not on the list of plans that the the nation of Israel thought might happen. Now, if they understood their history, they might actually see more of a possibility. And, you know, there's reasons for that, which we'll probably get into as we unpack some of the context. But what happens then when God's plan is not ours? And that's where that leads us to our second point today. God's plan may not be our plan. How can we say this? So what was the context of why God's people were sent into exile during this time? If you go earlier in the the book of Jeremiah, you can see that he warns God's people. And he's warning them, much in the same way that God's people have been warned in the Old Testament, that they are chasing after other gods. They are not worshiping the one true God 
the way that his people were commanded to way back during the time of Moses and the Ten Commandments. And when we read the Old Testament, we can see how this happens over and over and over again. And we might think, man, God's people, it's like, how can they not see, like, you know, there's this period of time where God, like, gets them through the Red Sea, but then quickly they forget, and then, you know, like, God provides them manna, but then they, like, build a golden calf and they start worshiping it. How can they, like, how can they keep doing this? But when we think about our lives, I think there are way more parallels to God's people in Israel than we might think. What do I mean by this? See, at this time, what would happen in the nation of Israel is people would go to the temple to worship, and they would go and and do all the things that existed in the temple worship at this time. But then when they would leave the temple, they would not be focused on godly things anymore, but they were heavily influenced by the culture and society around them. To the point that one of the things that the nation of Israel was starting to participate in during this time was the horrible atrocity of child sacrifice that other nations were practicing. And so they would go and worship God in the temple on the one hand, but then when they would leave the temple, they would be influenced by all of the things that were going on in society around them, things that we would describe as really terrible when you think about it. And that is why Jeremiah is sent to God's people as a prophet to warn them, hey, You need to turn back and worship the one true God and not follow all these other forces of culture that are out there. And so their lives, though they went to temple worship, were also dictated by the culture around them. Now, we should ask ourselves this morning, are we like the Israelites in some way? Now, I I am sure none of us are practicing the horrific rite of child sacrifice as God's people were back then. But we do need to ask ourselves, are there ways where our lives, like on one, at one moment, we're worshiping God, but then we go and the rest of our lives are dictated by what culture and society tells us. And that's what God's people were falling into at this time. And I would say, though our, um, our technology is very different, though our circumstances are very different, there are many ways that we are just like the Israelites, where an hour or two at church on Sunday or a couple hours at, on Wednesday night or Friday night, though it is certainly good for us, is not enough to drown out the ways that we are influenced by society and culture in our lives. And so as a result of that, that is how God's people found themselves in exile. You see this in the Old Testament. Periodically, God would send very big trials into the lives of his people to turn their attention back to him. Now, because God is not someone who's going to force us to worship him or to live our lives in a particular way, he gives us the guidance that we need. But because he doesn't force us to do that, many times we go astray. And what he does do is he uses reminders of our circumstances around us to turn us back to where our attention needs to be. And in this case, God's plan then was this exile. And so when we read this verse, like, God has plans for us, plans to bring us hope, plans to change our future. The future for God's people at this time was very different than what they would have expected. A lot of times we think, okay, God has plans for my future. That means I'm going to get into the exact college of my choice because God's word says it right there, right? Now, the contextualization of what God's people were going through at this time is totally not like that. And we see that in the context that we read. What happens in verse 5 as Jeremiah is speaking to God's people who are now exiles living in under the control of the nation of Babylon? What does he say? He says, build houses, get married, have families, plant gardens. I love that. It's like the houses, the, the families, like that's a normal part of life. But he says plant gardens, which a few of us in this room do and do pretty well, but most of us don't. And so like we're not like... And that's because this was a huge agrarian society at this time. Like, in another life, I would totally be a farmer, so I love, like, things like that because I think it's awesome. Like, I probably played too much Stardew Valley, and that's influenced me. And so, like, but the purpose of all of these directions is to show, like, hey, you are going to be here, and you're going to be here for a while, and this is your future. I have plans for you for, to, to give you hope, to bring you a future, but at the same time, it's not going to change for at least 70 years because that's what, that's what it says in the context of the verse. And that's why he's instructing them, start to get comfortable in this nation that you don't want to live in. 
And that's, that would be very challenging for the people of Israel at this time, right? This was their new home for at least 70 years. And if we could imagine what it would be like to be uprooted from our current home and have to go live in a place that we don't want to live in, how could we trust that God has a plan for us in that moment? And that's what's so powerful about what Jeremiah says to encourage the, um, the people of Israel. And so what happens when God's plan for our lives is not what we expect? Where is the good in that? And what we learn from Jeremiah's words and encouragement here is that God had a plan for his people, even in exile. And I want to ask then, has God ever done something in our lives that we thought was terrible in the moment, but turned out being for our benefit after a period of time? Now, maybe we haven't had that experience in our lives. Maybe we've had it in small ways. I have come to see in my life over and over and over again that something that can feel very terrible in the moment, I can look back and see later how God was at work for my good. One of, I'll just stick to one example, but um, when I was in high school, uh, I was convinced that someday I was going to be a professional roller hockey player. Now, that was like what I devoted all my time to when I wasn't at school. Daniel always talks about being in the NBA, but it's like that's, that was never a realistic dream for any of us. Like mine was actually more realistic because roller hockey was a very like, you know, much like less known sport. Like the road to get there was not as hard as like, you know, Daniel's dream of being the 12th man on the championship basketball team. So now that was never going to happen. And well, mine was never going to happen either. I was convinced that I was on that road. And so when I was in, uh, when I started high school, I tried out for one of the best club teams in our area, because it was a big sport back then. It's not anymore. That's why everyone's like, what, roller hockey? What even is that? And it's like, trust me, in the 90s, it was actually a big deal, okay? You guys weren't born yet. You may not even know what it means. You're playing hockey on roller blades. It's very similar, right? And so I tried out for one of the best club teams in our area, and somehow I made the team. And that was like such a big deal for me because that was what I spent all my time doing when I wasn't, you know, at school. And uh, this team, we had sponsorships from like hockey equipment companies. This was something I hadn't experienced in my life. Um, when we got all of our equipment, we got our giant bags because there's a lot of equipment when you play hockey. Like it's, it's pretty big, right? And so on one side of my equipment bag was my, my name and my number. And on the other side, there wasn't. So when I would carry it, which side was facing out? The side with my name on it, because it was like, hey, I am number seven on the Northern California Mustangs, and I'm going to be a professional hockey player someday, right? Like, and that's where I found my identity. And I loved it. And for two years, that was what I devoted so much time to during freshman and sophomore year of high school. Now, at the time, I was kind of attending our youth group on Fridays when I could. I'd stopped going to church Sundays because all our practices were Sundays. And after two years, my parents made me stop playing for this team. They didn't, um, they, didn't, uh, they didn't have a good view of kind of the leadership of our team. There were a lot of harmful influences, you could say, that um, kind of came with being a part of this team when we would travel, when we g would go off on tournaments, where some of the, the coaches would do things that were kind of questionable when we were out traveling, and they didn't like that. And as a result, they said, you're not going to play on this team any longer. And I was devastated when that happens. Because when you're 15 or 16 or younger, if something happens where you think it's like exactly what you want to do and the plans change, like you think it's the end of the world. You really do, all right? So for me, it was in this way, like being cut off from a team I had put all my time and energy into for two years. But for many of us, if we don't get into this, the school that we really, really want to go to, we are devastated. If the person we like doesn't like us back, it can feel like the end of the world. Like, what, if, what do I have to look forward to in the future? And that can really affect our mindsets. And yet, what that, um, and so what, what would happen was, I was kind of, well, anytime I was at home, I would just sulk. I would just like, I was really upset at my parents. I would try not to talk to them any under circumstances because it's like, how could you do this to me? I've put so much time and effort into this. How could you change this? Um, what I would do, is when they would like be out at work, I would think about, okay, my dad gets home like right around five o'clock. So at 4.50, I would like go out to the front driveway 
and I would like set up our hockey net and I would just like shoot pucks into it to be like, in my mind, be like, hey, dad, have you changed your mind yet? Like, I, you know, I'm ready for you to change your mind so I can go back to doing what I love. And he never did. And it was a huge point of tension in my relationship with my parents for a long time. And when I look back in hindsight, the blessing of that decision was that I could come back to church, this church, on Sunday mornings, which was something I had never done before. I had come to our youth group for several years on Friday nights, and I thought I had grown up going to church on Sundays, but not this church, CCIC South Valley. But the first Sunday I went in, I was still just sulking, because I was like, I don't want to be here. I want to be at the hockey rink right now. Like, what am I doing here? And then we started singing the songs, and back then, we sang pretty much the same songs every Sunday, like constantly. I was like, I know all these songs already. I'm like sulking in my attitude. I'm like, I don't want to be here. And then I would hear our pastor, Pastor Peter, who spoke at our retreat, who many of you know. I would hear him speak. And gradually, week after week, I realized, hey, this is exactly where I want to be. I did miss playing hockey, but it took, it took a period of time. But it helped me see that as bad as it felt in the moment, that God's plan was not my plan, that God knew what he was doing and had a plan and a purpose for me to come to know and love our church more than I had previously. And though it was something I definitely did not want to have happen in that moment, I can look back and I can see how God was at work. And verse 11 was very true, but it didn't mean that God's plan equaled my plan. And that's a truth about God that we have to learn if we are going to be his disciples, if we are going to trust him as God. God's plan does not always equal our plan, and yet his plan is for our good. And I can can point to countless times where God did something different than what I wanted to in the moment, but I could look back later and see that it was for my good. And that brings us to our last point that we see in this passage that God's plan is for our good. Now, we often might think that if God has a plan of how everything's going to work out, oh, then, like, what choice do I have? Like, how is it going to work out? Like, I don't, I'm kind of passive in the matter. And there's ways where that's true, where God might work outside of what we do. But we love verse 11. That's why it ends up being a, a bio verse, right? Or why we love to quote it. God has plans for my life, for my hope, and for my future. But when we get to verse 13 and 14, it might be a little more challenging. But I promise you, it's for our good. That's where we want to end today. And so Jeremiah, as he's sharing these words of truth with God's people, he directs them to these words in verse 13 where he says, and he's speaking from God's perspective for the people. He says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So we love verse 11, because God has a plan for us. God has a future for us. It's going to be for our good. But do we love verse 13, where it says, you will seek me, and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart? And so we might think of that one verse and think of how positive and encouraging it might feel, because it, it tends to make us believe that God's going to give us whatever we want in our lives. But it is directly tied to the fact that we've got to seek him as well to see what he's doing in the midst of his plans. Now, I could have chosen not to go to church after my parents made me stop playing for the hockey team. And I am thankful that something, and in in hindsight, this is where I think God is so gracious in how he works, because it doesn't make a lot of sense that I would over time embrace like coming back to church when I was kind of so upset, more at my parents. I don't think I was really upset at God in that moment. I probably was. I can't remember back that far. It was a long time ago. But over time, just being here, hearing the word of God, it made me see, hey, God's plan, it wasn't exactly what I thought, but it is good. And that's what God is trying to show the nation of Israel at this time. He's saying, look, you're going to be here for 70 years. Now, if you do the math, like, I'm not going to be alive at 111. So like if like, you know, I've uh, science and technology is advancing, but I've eaten way too unhealthily in my life to make it that far. Like if God sent me somewhere else for the next 70 years, like I'm not going to make it 70 years. And what that means is for the nation of Israel, some of their members were not going to make it home to see the promise that was going to be fulfilled here. 
That's just the fact of human life and aging, right? And we always look to the end goal that we're looking for to say, that's like what's going to bring me hope, and that's what's going to bring me joy in my future. But there had to be people who were a part of the nation of Israel who never got to see the return back to Israel after these 70 years in exile had passed. And what is God trying to say to them in that moment? And that's why he's encouraging them through the words of the prophet of Jeremiah, where he says, if you seek me now here in exile, you will find me. And for us, because we don't know what the future holds for us in this year, there will be joys, but there will also be trials. You can see this over and over and over again throughout the Bible. God doesn't simply take the trials away. But what he shows us is that he loves us and he wants to be with us in them. And that's what it means that he wants to give them a hope and a future. And look, for some of us, if our mindset is entirely just on earthly things, this is not going to work for us. We're going to say this is not good news. And I get it. But I'm thankful that as time has gone on, I've seen over and over again how faithful God is even when his plan is totally different than my own. And so we cannot have the hope of God's plan for us to bless us and to see, uh, see this goodness in our futures if we don't seek him as well. And that's why he encourages them. Settle down, have families, plant gardens. Work for the good of the place that you're in, even though it's not your hometown. And embrace it. And you will find, you will find my presence there with you. And he gives them a promise in verse 14 where he says, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And here's the future promise of it, which I think some of them never got to experience. He says, I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. I don't think anyone's experienced um, what it means to seek God's will wholeheartedly, regardless of the outcome of the circumstances, as much as Jesus when he was on this earth, right? And so if you think from an earthly perspective, he lived 30 some years and then he was crucified. Now, of course, he's the son of God and there was purpose and there was a reason in it. But at the moment that Jesus died on the cross, it was for our benefit so that we could know the living God. And so I think when we think back on his sacrifice for us and how it means we can know that God might possibly be with us in the worst moments of 2024, to me, that's good news. And that definitely was not the plan of the disciples as they're following Jesus around and and struggling with the fact that he was going to die on the cross. But you could see three days later after the fact of how good it was when he rose again and as the early church arises. And how, because of that, we all today can be a part of something that brings true hope regardless of our circumstances because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. He was the true example of being being content in the uncomfortability of the worst of human circumstances when he died for us on the cross. And I think that's why we can trust that though we might go through very difficult challenges in 2024, I pray that we don't, but if we judge based on how our lives go, there are always highs and lows, there's always ups and downs. But what we can learn from this really encouraging verse is that God never left his people throughout the duration of the Old Testament. There were trials, there were periods of disciplining for God's people, and yet he remained faithful to them year after year, generation after generation, and he still does so today. Um, I'm really excited to say that next Sunday, um, we're going to get to share what our theme of this coming year is. Um, Our elders have been praying together, and uh, we're really excited about where they've landed, but they're not um, sharing it with the Chinese side till next week, so we're going to wait till next week. Also, Daniel will start us on a sermon series that's going to last us a couple weeks as we look at our 2024 theme. But what we can see from this verse that I think points us to, like, if you think about, we, I joke about this when it comes to retreat, like youth retreat planning. Like when I'm with the other youth pastors and we have to come up with a theme, 
like our joke is like, you know, in the end, the theme is like pretty much always the same. It's some form of like follow God. We just like have like different words to kind of dress it up, right? But I love that we read these verses today because if you really think about our theme from 2022, which was 2022, that was 2023, but 2022, don't be angry. See, Joshua's got all the answers, right? If we think about ways that we could trust that we didn't have to be anxious in 2022, or last year, where put out into deep water was meant to, like Simon Peter, listen to the voice of God. It doesn't matter what theme we come up with as a church if we're not going to seek him the way that Jeremiah says here. And that's where this verse, I think, really, uh, I'm grateful that God directed me to this passage for this week just because um, it's a verse that I've always loved because it always sounded good when I was a kid. But once I got to study the context a little bit more later on as I grew up and as I went into seminary and, um, and got to see the truth in it, it was like, wow, that is how God promises to be with us regardless of the circumstances. So I'm excited for what God wants to uh, do in our lives for this coming year. And so I guess there isn't a specific form of application that I'm kind of calling on us to think about, but can we really think about what it means to seek him with all our hearts? And that's something that will help us like, experience this, the, the plan of God and the, the, the welfare he wants to show us, the hope and the future that he has for us. It may not always be the way that we want to experience it, but we can see throughout the course of the history of God's people how faithful God was to his word and how important it is for us then to seek him with all our hearts. Um, I think a great way that we, can, uh, that we can reflect on this this morning is uh, to do what we do the first Sunday of every month, which is to partake of communion. And so we're going to switch into a time where now um, we're going to take communion together this morning. And uh, last Sunday, I got to go to church with my parents, and they do communion quite a bit different than how we do it. But it was, um, I, it, it brought me back to that first Sunday that I came back to church after my parents made me stop playing for my hockey team. Because that on that Sunday, it was also communion Sunday. And I'm sitting there with a bad attitude. I'm like, I don't want to be here. And I could tell you, as much as we might think, like, it's a small cracker, it's a cup of grape juice. The symbolism of it really matters because it reminds us of what Jesus did for us on the cross, that he was the model of embracing God's plan, though it was something very painful for him from a human perspective. And I remember sitting there in our service and thinking of just how frustrated I was of how life was going at that time. And I don't want to call it like magic because it's like, you know, we don't believe in magic. We believe in like God's, God's blessings and God's promises and the work of the Holy Spirit. And so that must have been what it was. But as soon as the bread and the cup came around that day, it reminded me, hey, this might not be where you want to be right now, but this is exactly where God wants you to be. And that was at least the start of changing my mind to see, hey, God's plan might not be my plan, but I can trust that this is good for my life. And that's because what the communion reminded me of was what it meant that I was forgiven, that Jesus had died on the cross, that his body was broken for mine, that his blood was shed for mine. And we want to remember that today as we, um, as we begin uh, this new year.